Okay, so you can't ignore the costs of conservation. <clears throat> we have some very good papers showing that. We have some very simple papers like this one from Salit Carr. It uh, tries to build some scenarios of conservation for the Mediterranean uh, species. And they developed three scenarios. One that is fully coordinated when all uh, countries in Europe would work together to establish a comprehensive and international plan for, for saving biodiversity in the Mediterranean. Have some kind of partially coordinated with the European Union and non-European Union. And an uncoordinated scenario in which each country would do uh, the thing it has to do. So Spain will try to do uh, Spain's national plan for biodiversity protection, France will do the same, and that will be the same for Germany or Italy, Greece, okay? And then you end up with something like this. So if you take a look at France, this is the, perhaps the worst case, or Morocco. In a fully coordinated scenario, France would spend about 2.2 million euros, or billion, not sure, euros to protect biodiversity. But if, if France tries to do the same thing alone, considering the, the, the species-specific uh, requirements in France, the country would spend about three times more to do that. And you guys can understand why this happened? Why is that? Why France working together would spend three times less money than if the country decides to do the biodiversity conservation alone. Because species don't exist within one particular site. Good, that's it. That's because species from the Mediterranean are not only in France, they're occurring in other places. So if you set a target for a species, and that target is achieved, for example, in Spain or in Portugal, France don't have to worry about that species. It is already protected in Spain or Portugal, okay? So if you're using a kind of complementarity approach, your work, individual work, will be much easier because you can have the species protected in other places rather than your country, okay? But if you're trying to do that alone, then you have to protect all species that occur in France, in France. And that could be a problem because there will be so many places you will need to protect to get all those species protected in France, okay? And of course, we are assuming here that this fully coordinated scenario, it doesn't bring you problems or issues with lost in a species that use it to live in France, to occur in France, and now it is extinct in France, okay? This could be a problem for France. They don't want to lose the species. But this would not be a problem for the Mediterranean fauna. This species is not extinct from the Mediterranean. It is there. It's just not protected in France, okay? It has some political implications and social too. <clears throat> So spatial planning also can't rely on simple targets. So when I'm talking about defining a target for a species like 10%, 20%, 50% of its distribution, this is a very simple target. I'm saying that we need some minimum set of sites that will be able to protect the species and, and achieve that target. But that could be easy or simple. So if you're trying to include more complex things like evolutionary information or uh, phenotypic diversity or functional diversity, this is not a necessarily simple target. It gets more complicated because it relates to many other things like ecosystem uh, functions or ecosystem benefits, okay, and services. <clears throat> This is one place that tries to do that. It tries to understand uh, what are the best places to protect phylogenetic 
uh, diversity, again here in South Africa. And they're trying to do, trying to understand what are the effects of including that. And when you uh, consecutively uh, maximize species richness in the sites you're trying to protect, then what will happen with the gain in phylogenetic diversity? Is, that means that cons conserving more species that will get more phylogenetic diversity or not? What are the mismatches that will be between a plant that tries to protect species and a plant that tries to maximize phylogenetic diversity? Will, will it be the same? If it is the same, then that is good news. You can just use the species. That's the available information, the, the usually available information. But if it's not, then if you develop a conservation plan for the species and you are not capturing phylogenetic diversity, you're losing evolutionary processes, okay? <clears throat> and the tricky thing is, is that phylogenetic diversity also relates with functional diversity. And it tells us about what are the ecological processes that, or evolutionary processes that happen in a given place. So, Phylogenetic diversity means that you have species that are very differently from the evolutionary point of view. Or they are less related, evolutionary less related in a given area. If these species are very close related in that site we're trying to protect, then your phylogenetic diversity is low, okay? Species are very well uh, related. So the same goes for functional diversity. If you're trying to protect species that are very similar, that use the resources in a similar way, that have some common phenotypic aspects or phenotype, you have low functional diversity. The species will probably do the same thing in the ecosystem, the same function, they will act the same way. So you can try to maximize functional diversity and that means that you will get species that are ecologically different, okay? So you have different functions of the ecosystem being uh, done by those species. So it, obviously there is a relation between phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity. And you expect that when phylogenetic diversity increases and the species are consistently more or less, they're less related with each other, Functional diversity will also increase because you have some phylogenetic inertia. So if this species is not related to the other, the chances of the species being very different in its ecological requirements, it's higher, okay? So when phylogenetic diversity increases, functional diversity also increases. That, it's what you should expect from that relation between phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity. When, when you take a look at places, you can see some places in which functional diversity is much higher than the one you would expect by phylogeny. Okay? You have some kind of over dispersion in ecological traits. That means that the species in that place are very, very different from each other. Why this could happen? Well, this could have some kind of ecological processes behind, like competition. Competition is forcing the species to be different, so they will not compete and use the resources in the same way. And the species that are similar to each other end up being excluded from that side by competition. So competition is a, a force that is separating the species ecologically, so they look different. And if the species are very different in the place, you end up with high functional diversity. Okay? It could be just uh, a fast trait evolution in that place. For any reason, I don't know, you are in the tropics or in your uh, place, you have fast evolution rates and speciation. And species get, gets, they, they get different very fast. But you can also have the opposite thing. You can have some kind of deficit in functional diversity. When you have a much lower functional diversity than you will expect from phylogeny. 
And that could happen, for example, because of an, eco because of an ecological process is called environmental filtering. So we have some kind of environmental filter that selects species that are very similar. Only those species will be able to survive to that kind of conditions. And the species surviving to that particular kind of conditions, they will likely be very similar. They have the same traits, the same abilities that make them able to get through this filter. Understand that? So if you have a very strong ecological filter, it could be climate, it could be uh, natural fires, for example. And the species that will be able to survive to that fires, they should have some traits that are shared between them. And you, the, the final result of that is that you get a community that is very similar, and then functional diversity is low, okay? And it's lower than you could expect by phylogeny. Or maybe you have some kind of slow trait evolution, the opposite thing from the other. And then you have some interesting results like this. So this is uh, the deviation from the expected relation between phylogenetic diversity and functional diversity for global mammals. And you see that here, for example, in the Amazon, you have higher functional diversity than here. Okay? But the functional diversity expected by phylogeny is actually low. So we're having some kind of high habitat heterogeneity here, and we're having species packed in different niches. But for any given reason, the functional diversity here is lower than we should expect from that kind of processes or from, from phylogeny. And here is higher. So you can have, for example, selected extinctions here from glaciations. And then these species are so different because the new species that colonize that environment are very different from the species that were there before glaciation. So you end up with some higher phylogenetic functional diversity than we would just expect by phylogenies. And this leads you to some more kind of complex problem that what should you preserve? High functional diversity, low functional diversity? What do you want? What are the goals? And this is why establishing the goals could be challenged. You, you really need hard thinking about that problem. So if you're thinking, let's say we're thinking about phenotypic or, fi or functional diversity. You mean that if you have high functional diversity, you're trying to protect places in which species are very different, and then we will get very different ecological processes or ecosystem functions happening in that place, okay? But if you are protecting a place with low functional diversity, then you, you are saying that species are very similar and they should be doing the same services in the ecosystem, and what you get is redundancy. But redundancy can be good. It means that if anything happens in that place, the chances are higher if that community will get back to its original position because species are similar and you have ex excluded some species but there will be other species doing the same thing so you keep that ecological process, okay? Well, it's, there's no easy way. You should think about it and you should try to understand what are the effects of protecting one site or another. With high functional diversity or low functional diversity, you gotta decide. Okay? And you have to define what is the actual goal and what could, can be the target for that goal. And that could be challenging. <clears throat> Here's another example. Brazil has some plans for conserving a lot of uh, pieces of biodiversity like mammals, birds, and plants. Uh, this is uh, an exercise we did. This is the map of functional diversity and functional distinctiveness in Brazil. It means that they, here we have more unique evolutionary species than in, other, than in places like here in Brazil. Then you can use that information and try to find what are the places where I can maximize functional diversity or phylogenetic diversity and what are the places that are similar for both strategies. So places in which 
I can allocate resources to maximize both functional and phylogenetic diversity at the same time. So we're not working with species here, we're actually working with other aspects of diversity, considering ecosystem and ecological processes and functions, and not uh, only the number of species of that side. Okay? That could be included here. Okay. <clears throat> so, there are some research trends in spatial conservation planning. That would be the evaluation of conservation outcomes, it means that try to evaluate the real effect of the plan that has been implemented. Okay? To go to that site, measure the efficiency of your plan. Are these species being protected? Are population being recovered? Are invasive species being uh, uh, excluded from some kind of area? Methods for dealing with multiple alternative conservation actions. This is a clear trend. If you'd like to work with that, that, that would be a cool uh, thing to, to work with. Planning for habitat restoration. So again, conservation actions are not just about creating protected areas. You can try to uh, optimize the investment of time, resources, people, money to restore habitats. Okay, this is a, an important an important thing that's for which methods are being developed right now. Inclusive of economic feedbacks, then delivering publicly available resources. This could be very important. GIS layers, data collections, it is actually very important to do the plan. So if you don't have data, it's very difficult to implement a plan. Okay? It's difficult to run a conservation planning analysis if you don't know what the features are, if you don't have access to, cost, uh, to costs of, that, of particular actions, if you do not have data to, to tell you where the species will be, you need to have the data. And you, you need to make that data available to people. So if you are compiling data and gathering different sources of data, it's very good that you make it available so people can use it and try to do something for, for conservation, okay? Then, of course, dealing with the effects of uh, climate change is a clear trend. Climate change, again, is a hot topic in the literature. You can do a lot of things with this. There is also a prominence of marine and freshwater planning. The amount of terrestrial uh, protected areas we have is far much than the marine or freshwater ones. So there is a clear need to plan for marine protection and for freshwater protection. So Brazil, for example, we have something about 11% of the country is already protected in some kind of legal protected area. And then we have sign that uh, a convention of biological diversity and we have that commitment of protecting 17% of Brazilian land, okay? We have already protected something about 11%, so we need to protect six more at least. But as for the marine system, things are very different. We have committed about protecting 10% of the marine uh, exclusive economic zone in Brazil, and we have about 1%, 1.6% that is actually protected as no-take zones. So we have a very large path to, to protect marine areas in Brazil. And this is uh, uh, one of the most prominent needs we have in many countries. There's also a need for planning for invertebrate conservation. You know, there is this tendency of planning for vertebrates and this is because the data is more readily available. You have some international data on uh, vertebrate distribution. You have the IUCN, the NatureServe, and other uh, database. But we don't have very good data available for invertebrates. There are in some collections, people are not making it available. 
And so there is some uh, need to plan for invertebrate conservation because they can do s of so importance for ecosystem functions and we're just losing it because we're doing plans for birds, for example. And we also need more studies in the neotropics in Asia and Africa. We have the, most of the conservation planning science has been developed in Australia uh, and the US and some part in Europe. So we have a lot of interesting work done in, in those places of the world. But we really need to have more studies to, from Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, and from countries in Africa and in Asia. Okay, that's a clear research trend in this science. So, take home message. The volume of research in spatial conservation planning will continue to accelerate. So more and more people are working with this and work is not only uh, being done within the, the, the universities and institutions. So we have NGOs working with that, government people working with that, um, and people from the private sector that are interested in, in doing this kind of research and obviously the academia. So research on, on this topic will continue to accelerate. The field also tends to expand and become more inclusive. <clears throat> so in the 90s, we're very concerned about that conservation planning was about establishing protected areas. But now we are moving beyond reserve selection, trying to implement restoration and monitoring plans and how we can optimize resource allocation for, for these two. Methods for predicting and alleviating consequences of climate change will be particularly important. It's another trend. And this is the most basic idea you can get about how dynamic the distribution of the species are and how dynamic a conservation plan needs to be. So it will have some particular importance. Social political consideration will become imperative now that we have we have had a lot of discussion about methods, methodological issues, and we have different softwares available. It's time to stop discussing how can we do that, because we know how can we do that, and try to include some social political considerations and what are the feedbacks we have uh, by including this in the actual implementation of the plan. And of course, education will gain importance because we need to reduce this gap between the scientific knowledge and on the ground ac actions. So capacity building will be very important. People uh, teaching how to do conservation planning, different courses like this one, the biodiversity informatics training course, will become more and more important so we can uh, share the knowledge that uh, academics have been developed for the last 30 years on systematic conservation planning and that it could reach people and stakeholders that are actually doing the thing, okay? I'm mostly concerned about <clears throat> methodological, uh, conceptual and uh, aspects of these kind of things. But then I have colleagues that work in the Ministry of the Environment in Brazil or some agencies that are working with the environmental issues in Brazil. And these are the guys that will discuss with the politicians the things. So you need to give them this kind of knowledge so they can uh, get their work done and the plan will actually be implemented, okay, eventually. That's it, the first part. How was that? Okay, any problems? No? Any questions? <clears throat>